levels of our immune response um, and uh, the lessons uh, that we've all learned from atopic dermatitis, thanks to Dr. Beck's work. So um, uh, Dr. Beck, take it away and welcome to San Diego by webinar. Lisa, we don't hear you. I know we can though, we've tested this. Okay, we got it. Good. You guys can hear me, right? Yes, scare me for a minute, but thank you. <laughs> okay, if I'm too loud, somebody send a little text. Does this sound about like the right volume? That's perfect to me. Okay. Uh, so uh, I usually tell people I'd be happy to have any interruptions, um, but that still is true. You'll just have to type your interruptions or hold them till the end. Uh, it, it's really sad for me that I'm not there in person. I really like the, the contact with a lot of friends and colleagues that are uh, at UCSD. Um, you know, Rich, is, as he said, is a you know, longstanding friend and colleague, Larry Eichenfeld, Tisa Hada. Anna DiNardo, and one of the alums from our program is there, Michael Bradshaw. So I just wanted to do a shout out to lots of good buddies. I hope I didn't forget anybody. I'm you know, really honored to be giving the uh, Richard Stoughton uh, lectureship. Let me just see how I can, okay. Um, and I'm sure you all know about him quite well, uh, or quite a bit. He, um, he really was the, the stereotype of you know the perfect teacher, clinician, researcher, and really, as you heard from Rich, uh, contributed extensively to our understanding of the disease, and a lot of it's germane to what I'll be talking about here. So I wondered with that, could I put up my first poll, Paula? Okay, so which of the following statements are true about Dr. Richard Stoughton? He was the first chair of the Department of Durham, you can all, uh, and there's more than one true answer. This is gonna be true throughout this, that you can click as many of the true answers as possible as you think are there. So whether he made major contributions to skin permeability, did he obtain his PhD from the University of Rochester? That would be New York, not uh, Minnesota. Best known for the vasoconstrictor assay and correctly predicted PUVA treatments would lead to skin cancers. Paula, how do we know when everyone's answered? I'm seeing some answers come in right now. Uh, is there any way, to, oh, okay. Let's give people a little chance to get ready for this and then I have three or four more throughout the talk. This is trying to make sure you're all awake. <laughs> hey, hey Paula, I'm noticing there's a little thing on my screen anyway that says hosts and panelists can't vote. Is there any way to change that? Uh, let me see. Either that or we could knock a lot of people off as panelists so they can vote. Let me see. And uh, Dr. Barrio, yeah, I, I also see the, there's four questions on the poll, that's what we're, but uh, I think Dr. Beck only wants you to answer the first one right now. Correct. Don't worry, we'll get a lot faster after we figure this one out. Thank you, Paula. By the way, big shout out to Paula who set this all up, which is not trivial for us older folks, and also uh, was willing to do these poll questions. So many thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, while we're working on it, uh, Lisa, do you want to forego the mystery? Yeah. Okay. So we'll 
we'll get ready for it by the time we get to our second one. So um, the correct answers here was that he obviously made major contributions to the measurement of skin permeability. And as you heard from Rich, he really is the one who developed the vasoconstrictor assay that we still use today to measure the strength of corticosteroids. And he did it um, by looking at clinical response to psoriasis. So that was his seminal paper. Um, let's see if I can, I might, yeah, there we go. That was his seminal paper, in, you know, in archives of dermatology. Um, he also did quite a few um, topic, you know, covered quite a few topics in his career. They're very relevant to what we'll be talking about and quite relevant to some of the work that Rich does. So he was not the first chair of the department though, and many of you know that that was a trick because he was chair of the division. And at that point in 1974, when he became chair, it was a division and it was also Scripps as well as UCSD, if I understand correctly. The person who got their PhD from University of Rochester was in fact, Rich Gallo. Um, and then uh, lastly, he actually did predict that PUVA would likely lead to skin cancers. So, um, you know, really thoughtful, um, observant uh, clinician that we all hope to emulate. And I feel very honored to give a talk in his name. So I can't start any talk without, of course, giving you, um, it, let me see if I can get rid of that. Do you guys still see the poll in the center? No, it's, uh, it's gone. Okay, good, I, I got rid of it, okay. So let me see if I can get rid of it here. Okay, so um, I do have a co some conflicts and one of them, Regeneron Sanofi, will come up because I will talk just a little bit about uh, the relevance of TH2 blockade to some of the concepts I'll be covering. So it, I thought it would be good to start first with a background about atopic dermatitis. I know you've got lots of experts uh, at UCSD in this area, but I think for some of you who don't deal with eczema on a regular basis, you might not realize how really common this condition is with up to 20% of children having this. And we now think the estimates of adults could be as high as 10%. We know that this, uh, this disease has increased um, for a number of years, almost doubling um, every couple of decades, but it has really plateaued in the last 10 to 15 years. And that's really in developing country, developed countries like our own or in Europe or Japan. In developing countries, it is still increasing. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, where it will plateau in those countries. It uh, typically develops as a childhood disease, and we think now about 50% of the cases are under six years of age. This is less than what we used to say. We used to often say 80% under two years, and that was not correct now that we have more information. The natural history of this disease is very encouraging because 70% of the patients uh, that are childhood onset will get better or resolve at some point. The problem is, we don't have a really good way to predict when that will happen. And that, of course, is one of the most common questions we get from patients and their families. The other peculiar feature of this disease is its real susceptibility to infections that primarily enter through the skin. And the most common bacterial is staph, um, and that's the area Rich has done a tremendous amount of work in. And also uh, a number of viral infections, and we're continuing to describe new ones. And I'm hoping COVID won't fall into that, uh, but ACE2, uh, the entry receptor, is expressed on basal keratinocytes, so theoretically that could be a problem. So just a few pictures of, you know, these viral and bacterial side effects that you all know very well, and sometimes can be somewhat difficult to pick up. Fortunately, eczema vaccinatum, we don't expect to see, uh, you know, much at all, although there was a case about eight years ago in Chicago, which was from an army recruiter, recruit, who got it and then unfortunately was sent back home rather than being deployed and his child had eczema. And so that child was severely affected but did recover. So this disease, not surprisingly, is associated with a number of other so-called atopic conditions uh, listed here. We used to call it a triad and now we often call it a tetrad. Um, it's also associated with some psychosocial features, uh, particularly in uh, children and adolescents uh, age group. Uh, 
and that does pose a problem in the school districts, and so it's important to be aware of that. The depression and anxiety, though, is certainly um, found in all ages. So one of the things we've often been interested in is the notion of an atopic march, because we see all these different allergic diseases clustering together. And the question is, you know, does one disease help predict the next disease? So before I get into this uh, slide, could I have the next poll? So the next poll is going to be which of the following statements are true? And the first one will be food allergy is more commonly associated with AD in the adult population. The second option will be eggs, shellfish, and peanuts are the most common food allergens. The third will be asthma is more commonly associated with childhood AD than adult AD. And then Strict, the, the fourth one is strict peanut avoidance in infancy is the best way to reduce sensitization. Oops. And the last one is AD patients most commonly suffer from hay fever more than asthma, more than allergic conjunctivitis. Did I really screw you up here, Paula? <laughs> So let me, let me go ahead and just give you that. Oops. Okay. So uh, that question, the true statements were that asthma is more common in childhood AD than in adults. Um, adult is a less uh, atopic associated condition than childhood AD. Eggs, shellfish, and peanuts are the most common food allergens? No, it's eggs, cow's milk, and peanuts are the most common food allergens. But eggs, shellfish, and peanuts are the most severe reactions you typically see to food allergens. Food allergy is very uncommon in the atopic dermatitis population in adults. Strict peanut avoidance in infancy is what we were telling people for years, and now Let's see, I can get rid of that. Oh no. Sorry, I just saw the chat that you guys weren't seeing it. Can you see now? Yes, now we see okay, it. Okay, I'm very sorry. That's okay. Um, and actually, let me, while, while, we're, while we're trying to work this out, it appears um, that for the polling, if you look across the bottom of everyone's screen, below uh, now where we see Dr. Beck's slide, you'll see one of the uh, highlighted white uh, symbols that says polling. If you click that polling, it'll bring the poll up. Everyone needs to complete all four questions in advance and then submit it. Um, and then, so we can't complete them one at a time. But I think we can then, uh, Lisa, when you're ready to go to your question number three, uh, perhaps we could show the poll results and we can compare people's guesses now to um, what the reality is. Would that work for you? Yeah, that sounds great. And maybe it just makes sense for everybody to go ahead and complete the, all the polls. I think I have four. Yeah. And, and then we'll just at the end go through them. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah, it, it looks like they'll just have to be uh, all done now as a pretest. Very good. So what I'm showing you on the slide that I'm hoping you can still now see is an article that was presented looking at whether they could predict from a Canadian birth cohort which atopic derm patients would go on and develop in the first group asthma by three years of age or allergic rhinitis by three years in the middle group or food allergy in the final group. And they first look at what's the relative risk if you had AD at one year of age and asthma. And you can see there's no risk. But if you are sensitized to allergens, and these were aeroallergens and uh, food allergens, it was uh, 10 different skin prick tests, that increased your risk for 
uh, at, for asthma at three years. But there was a real interaction when you combined atopic dermatitis and sensitization for the ability to predict the risk for asthma at three years. So again, if we move now to hay fever, all by itself, atopic dermatitis at one year of age is quite predictive of the risk of hay fever. That's the most common allergic disease associated with atopic dermatitis is hay fever. But if you now look at the interaction with sensitization, you again see an increased relative risk. So the blue is the increase of combining these two. And the biggest increase that you see is really when you look at food allergy, where having AD at one year, and the more severe your AD is, the greater the risk for food allergy. If you're sensitized, so for some reason your skin is susceptible to becoming IgE sensitized to things presented on the skin surface, now you have an incredible interaction. So again, this sort of argues that there are ways that we might be able to utilize information early in life to help predict your risk to march on to these other allergic diseases. So uh, the theme of this is that the epithelium really is their interface uh, to the environment. And of course, it's where we get exposed to micro and environmental and pet allergens. It's also where we get exposed to microbes. And more and more we're hearing about how we, it's our exposure to toxins and pollutants uh, that may all lead to some aggravation and inflammation if our skin isn't functioning well. It's also the, the cell that needs to protect us from this constant wet, dry scenario that we put our skin through on a daily basis or put our infants through um, regularly. And then it's also um, important for helping us regulate the extremes of weather and temperature, which you guys don't have a lot of, but we, you, know, you certainly have the dryness, um, but we have uh, pretty wide fluctuations. So it's not surprising that when you take a look at different locales that have very different environments based on humidity and ultraviolet exposure, which might affect vitamin D and temperature and, um, and precipitation, you see very different rates of eczema. And so it appears to be much higher rates of eczema in places like where I live, Rochester, New York, versus where you live, uh, San Diego. Um, so that does, we think, play a role in modifying your susceptibility to disease, um, although the, your genetic makeup is obviously part of that as well. And we think that that effect is really made primarily through how it affects the epithelium. So the epithelium we think of as really a sentinel, um, and it's there to help us look out for danger and respond to that danger. And the question is, is the best response here to go on the offense or to just set up a very good defense. And I would argue that one of the premises here is if your epithelium has set up its defense appropriately, then it'll be quite protective. So shown here is a cartoon that's often shown when they talk about the uh, LEAP study, which was by Gideon Lack and his group that highlighted that what we've been telling our young children uh, with eczema uh, and parents with atopy to avoid peanuts for six, the first six months of life was in fact probably not right. And at one point we actually said for the first four years of life, you were to avoid peanut exposure. Now we know from the LEAP study that early introduction through the gut actually seems to be tolerizing, and there's a little bit of data emerging to explain the mechanism by which giving an allergen or an antigen through the mouth would tolerize you to that. And of course, it relies largely on the development of antigen-specific T regulatory cells that dampen immune responses. While in contrast, if we look at the other epithelium that we're going to spend most of our time talking about, which is the epidermis, that uh, particular surface seems to be really good and robust at responding to any perturbation with an inflammatory and an immune response. And quite often the default immune response is really one that would be characterized as type 2 immunity or Th2 immunity, characteristic of allergic diseases. So you might actually view that the development of food allergy is almost determined by how quickly were you able to get the allergen in through the gut and tolerize versus having the child get exposure to peanut powder on their skin surface. 
And that really is sort of uh, how we are thinking about that. It's, it's not surprising that Native Americans routinely fed their children poison ivy for the same reason, that that would make them tolerant of uh, exposure through topical or aerosolized poison ivy in fires um, you know, in their normal life. So as I said, the best way for the epithelium to really protect itself is to establish a really good offense. Um, or really good defense, I'm sorry. And that defense really starts first with a physical barrier function. So if your epithelium is able to prevent any of these environmental uh, irritants, um, allergens, microbes from gaining access to the immune system, then you won't initiate any inflammation. And so we're lucky then in the skin, we have these two barrier structures, the stratum corneum, which has been quite well studied and consists of these pa tightly packed corneocytes surrounded by a very complex lipid structure, both of which are very important to have a very formidable stratum corneum barrier. Below that in the next layer down is a tight junction barrier, shown here by the red balls. And that is the barrier structure that all other epithelial beds require. And that's the only barrier structure that others use. We think that when you have a really good barrier function, you really don't initiate an immune response because your antigen presenting cell, shown here as a Langerhans cell, doesn't penetrate through the tight junctions to sample any of the allergens or antigens or irritants here because they stay below and, and the allergens and irritants cannot penetrate as well. We also now recently not found out that sensory nerve endings tend to get clipped right at the level of the tight junction. So you really don't sense itching or other uh, sensations like burning as long as you maintain both of these barrier structures, the stratum corneum and the tight junction. And lastly, a number of the so-called innate immune receptors, the group that's probably best known are the toll-like receptors. These are the receptors that initiate immediate responses to tissue damage or to uh, bacterial or viral or fungal exposure. And they're the initial protection we have to those sorts of insults. They interestingly are only expressed below these two barrier structures. So, a good skin barrier um, does in fact protect us from responding to any of these environmental insults. And that's why our skin spends most of its time very inert and very non-inflamed and non-endemitous. Now there's another aspect of this barrier structure and that's the antimicrobial barrier structure. And this is an area again, Rich has contributed significantly to showing that there are a couple of big classes, these human beta defensins, Human beta defense in one is constitutively expressed, um, and the two through four are typically more inducible um, antimicrobial peptides. Then we have one member of the cathelicidin family and dermicidin, and in fact, this list is much larger than just these four categories, but many of them tend to be produced in the lamellar bodies, and then they require some processing where they're expressed and have their function more superficially. So we have both a physical barrier structure and an antimicrobial barrier structure that really keep us from having inflammation on our skin surface under normal conditions. But sometimes those, that structure falls apart. And so we know if, for example, you have filaggrin mutations and filaggrin is shown here and it gets cleaved into these filaggrin breakdown products, and then uh, we get even further degradation into these uh, natural moisturizing factors that help to moisturize the skin surface. If you lack those, then some of the structural integrity of the stratum corneum is lost. We have uh, an autosomal recessive disease caused by the, a mutation in LEC-T1, which is a, a protease inhibitor. And this, um, this, ends, this inhibitor helps us from having excessive desquamation here because normally we only activate our calocrine enzymes at the superficial layer here. And under normal situations, we just have orderly um, desquamation of the superficial layer of the stratum corneum. But when you lack this, in, this protease inhibitor, you start getting desquamation at all layers. 
and really kind of a peeling skin or desquamation looking uh, condition. And that condition we know of as Netherton syndrome caused by a mutation in the gene called Sphinx 5 but it really um, translates to a mutation in the peptidase inhibitor called LEC-T1. And those children, autosomal recessive, tend to present with a characteristic hair feature, trichorexis invaginata, and this tremendous amount of peeling skin. And they can also get this characteristic whirling appearance we call ichthyosis linearis circumflexa. And what I think is interesting about this uh, monogenetic condition is it's strongly linked to a type 2 immune deviation. So you break this barrier by breaking this stratum corneum um, barrier, and we now know that that actually also affects the tight junction um, when you break this. They then develop a pathway that leads to this deviation of the immune system that's very characteristic of what you see in atopic dermatitis. And these patients will also suffer from, not uncommonly, from allergic rhinitis and asthma. So one common pathway to get to those atopic conditions is loosening of this outer layer of the skin as demonstrated by Netherton syndrome. So what happens in atopic dermatitis when this barrier or perimeter function is breached? Well, as we kind of alluded to on the previous slide, if you get loosening of your tight junctions, you now get antigen-presenting cells like Langerhans cells coursing through, and now they can sample things that are present on the skin surface, from allergens and microbes to um, irritants as well. And then we also see that the nerve fibers that normally are not causing any itching or burning are now able to course through to the skin surface. And so this is why our patients, when we ask them to put on moisturizers, will often tell us, or topical steroids, will tell us that that actually initiates an itch and burn response. And that's why I think a lot of them really don't like topical treatments, because they really have their sensory nerve endings now coursing up to a superficial area where they can really sense even things that we think are benign, like moisturizers. And so we also see that allergens and microbes, when we have opened tight junctions, can reach down and actually signal through these innate receptors. And why is that important? Well, that initiates a really pro-inflammatory response, something we often refer to as almost a danger signal. And whenever you get a danger signal, you're likely to get a more robust immune response. So the breaching of these tight junctions leads to a, bit, a better ability to take up allergens and antigens and present them to the immune system under the influence of a lot of inflammation initiated by the innate immune receptor triggering and more likely to have a greater sense of itch scratch um, cycle initiated. So the story about barrier function really emerged when the filagra mutation story in 2006 uh, was uncovered, and that's where they found a number, typically about five null mutations account for the majority of filagra mutations worldwide, and they are strongly linked to your risk for atopic dermatitis with odds ratios that are very high, a modest odds ratio with asthma, and a pretty high odds ratio for peanut allergy. If you uh, then break down, sorry, there we go. If you look at one of the subphenotypes of atopic dermatitis, which are those patients that get that herpes complication called eczema herpeticum, the odds ratio is very high. So again, arguing that something about filagra mutation may lead to either barrier defects, or we'll talk about it in a minute, may lead to some other epithelial downstream changes that aren't necessarily due to the structural changes. If we go down here to asthma, where you saw a modest association, it turns out that association really disappears if there's no associated um, skin disease. So it really is only associated with asthma if you find an individual that's also got clinical um, skin disease or atopic dermatitis. But what's also been very interesting as people have looked at this further is filagra mutations subset AD even further. 
and suggests that those who have those mutations are more likely to have more severe disease, longer duration, earlier onset, more likely to be atopic in that they're allergic to numerous allergens. There is some data that suggests that they, this leads to a barrier defect. It's a little vague exactly what defect it is, but it appears that hydration is probably part of the problem because you don't get the natural moisturizing factors being produced if filaggrin levels are lower. Um, and then what I think is particularly interesting, which is why I put it in red, is it also initiates an inflammatory response when you have reduced filaggrin in the epithelial cells themselves. So they release, release things we call alarmins, and these are often IL-1 family members, and some of these cytokines that promote type 2 immune responses that are characteristic of atopic diseases. So moving on to why would barrier disruption lead to type 2 deviation, the immune deviation we know is characteristic of this disease because dupilumab works in most of these patients. So we think that there are a number of proteins, two, two of them are shown here, may be defective uh, and reduced in expression either on a genetic or acquired basis, and that would lead to some barrier dysfunction, but scratching can also do that. Um, and when this happens, the epithelium produces these mediators we now call alarmins that I alluded to on the previous slide, the ones that are most tightly linked to promoting a type two immune response, namely an immune response characterized by the cytokines of IL-4 and IL-13, as well as IL-5, are the ones I've shown here in this blue circle. So IL-33, TSLP, and IL-25. It's important to know that pharmaceutical companies are developing antagonists to each of these alarmants. Some of them look like they're showing greater promise than others, but this has definitely caught the interest of drug development in hopes that this might help all atopic conditions. So it turns out that these alarmants could be triggered actually by the actions of a number of the allergens because several of the allergens actually are proteases. So they can actually trigger the release of these alarmants through a protease uh, mediated mechanism. But some of them also actually act activate innate receptors such as dectins and TLRs. So those would be other ways besides barrier disruption that you could get these. And we also know that uh, a number of microbes, but Staph aureus in particular, has been well studied for its ability to do this as well through several mechanisms, mostly mediated by virulence factors that it produces. So we have many ways by which our epithelium could be triggered genetically and in an acquired way to release things from the epithelium that would promote the classic immune response we, we, know, to, uh, we know is characteristic of atopic dermatitis. So this is a study that was very interesting done in a small cohort of, of Korean children that were high risk for atopy because both parents had atopic conditions. And they took this uh, small cohort and did tape stripping. And when they tape stripped these 75 children and eluded those tape strips and did mass spectroscopy for one of the alarmants, TSLP, they observed that in these children, uh, when we, they tape stripped them at two months of age, the amount of TSLP found on those tape strips was quite predictive of the, of the likelihood of developing atopic dermatitis diagnosed by a physician at two years of age. So shown here are the odds ratio and just having the TSLP from these tape strips at two months gave you a very high odds ratio. If you now combine that with the family history, that odds ratio gets even higher. So that gives you some hint that there's some epithelial abnormality seen on an immunologic basis prior to the development of atopic dermatitis that really helps us predict who might develop uh, atopic derm. And so I've talked quite a bit about how atopic derm is a disease characterized by uh, an overrepresentation of the Th2 pathway which is characteristically used to clear parasites and is found in almost all, all allergic disorders and is often accompanied by high antibody titers, particularly IgE. 
So we do know that in atopic dermatitis, there are individual subjects that might have a little bit of a TH17 response, a TH22 response, and in the very chronic phase of the disease, meaning after a lesion has been smoldering for weeks, there's often a mixture including TH1 as well. But TH2 always dominates in the early lesion and in the late lesion, uh, which is not accurately represented, unfortunately, in most review articles. So it is the one persistent T helper population present at both stages of the disease. So when we think about this TH2 um, condition, we know there are a number of key cells important in that. That's the innate lymphoid cell type two that helps initiate the TH2 response, also basophils. These first two cells are present in tissue sites um, in, under homeostatic conditions. And then when they get activated, they um, help uh, initiate a permanent memory TH2 response. So when we think about this, we think that these, any kind of perturbation at the skin surface leads to this alarm and response that helps act first on ALC2 and basophils and ultimately on TH2 cells and causes the production of the characteristic and canonical TH2 cytokines shown here that have their actions on increasing eosinophils in the blood and in the peripheral tissue and activating them and causing the B cell to switch to a plasma cell that now produces instead of IgG, it produces IgE. But we know these TH2 cytokines also have other effects that actually now feed back and cause more problems with the epithelium. And shown here are reductions in a number of the stratum corneum and tight junction proteins, as well as several of the proteins that are important in the lipid uh, bilayer of the stratum corneum. They feed back and reduce the expression of some of the innate immune receptors that might be helpful in eradicating the staph colonization state that's characteristic of this disease. They can also feed back and diminish some of the epithelial derived antimicrobial peptides. And they tend to antagonize a lot of the beneficial effects of TH17 cytokines, which are actually uh, TH17 cytokines are very good at barrier repair and at eradicating bacteria on the skin surface. But unfortunately, it's really the relative ratio of TH2 to TH17 cytokines that determine which prevails. So we also know that they can lead to epidermal thickening, although IL-22 is probably more potent at doing that. And the question is, does this all collectively explain why our patients seem to be so susceptible to being colonized with Staph aureus and in some of our patients getting infections with Staph aureus? So stay tuned and we'll get back to that point. So I know all of you've had a chance to be using dupilumab in your practice. It's you know approved for 12 years of age and up. Um, a different dosing based on whether you're 60 kilograms or over in the adolescent population. And Larry can update us, but I think any moment now, we're hoping to hear about the six to 12 years of age approval. We were lucky to be able to get Dupilumab for a patient that was really struggling. Um, and let me show you what I was doing to try to treat this poor girl. You can see here, this is an old eczema herpeticum site. She kept getting that despite chronic suppression. And so I had tried, pulses of prednisone, phototherapy, high doses of cyclosporin, um, went up to five milligrams uh, per kilogram uh, at the highest dose. And then when we got her uh, finally on dupilumab, you can see that she really improved dramatically. So this is an amazing drug uh, for this condition. So if we block TH2 cytokines, uh, as we can do with dupilumab, because it blocks IL-4 and IL-13 uh, by blocking a, a subunit of the common receptor, what happens to the epithelium? And so what's sad a little bit is we still don't know if, it, it, if it's able to uh, normalize or revert the barrier defect, but we can see that it reverts several other epithelial features, and probably most prominently, is that it normalizes proliferative signals. And shown here is it normalizes an inflammatory keratin called keratin-16 that is very highly expressed at baseline in our eczema patients. But if you see four weeks into treatment, this is placebo here, and this is dupilumab treated below, you could see a real reduction in this inflammatory keratin, uh, which is virtually gone by week 16. So there's really tremendous enthusiasm that this appears to be normalizing 
a number of the features that are characteristic of epithelial problems in this disease. But again, we don't yet know if it normalizes some of their barrier defects. So we've been interested in instead looking at how tight junctions look in our patients. And so these are some whole mount stains that we do for a tight junction molecule called occludin. And we are looking here at looking down on the epithelium and that's why we're looking around the edge of epitheliums and you see this honeycomb like appearance of where the staining is for tight junctions. And it helps you to appreciate that this is a really um, very a robust barrier structure because it goes around two layers of the stratum granulosum layer. And so in healthy people, we see this nice double layer, very thick, but in our atopic derm patients, it tends to be less thick, not so clear that it's two layers of stratum granulosum, and what we call really fragmented, because it's kind of dark in some areas and not in others. And we were intrigued that where it's really fragmented, we start seeing a little bit more of a stain for the Langerhans cells. So you can stain for that by looking at HLA-DR, and you can see that we see a lot of uh, Langerhans cells penetrating through to the surface of the skin in our fragmented atopic derm patient samples that we don't see in the control samples from healthy individuals. And again, what's pretty interesting about this is this is in non-lesional skin. So now if we just color our antigen presenting cells based on kind of their size, but you can see in some cases it becomes like one big blob, you can see wherever we have fragmentation in these two atopic derm samples, we see a real clustering of these antigen presenting cells. And I'll show you here so you can appreciate it. So most of the time, antigen presenting cells are dispersed quite evenly, as you see on the periphery here. But because the central area had this fragmented pattern of its tight junctions, you see that they cluster very tightly. And here are two different examples to show you what's the sort of picture we see. And we think it also is interesting because it hints that there might even be antigens coming through at that site. Because if we look at where the dendrites go, they tend to go through one single area as though there's an antigen there that they're trying to reach. So that's one way you can look at an epithelial barrier, but it's not really function. And so function, I think, is important to, um, to talk about how would you measure that. And I think there's several different ways. None of these are perfect, and I think we're still in hopes of finding a more robust uh, functional assay. But what you hear mostly in the literature is transepidermal water loss, which can be done by a number of non-invasive instruments. This is just one of them, Aquaflux. So you can look at stratum corneum hydration, also done with a probe that looks much like this and is non-invasive. You can do a stratum corneum integrity assay, which I'll show you in just a minute with the cartoon over here. And you can also look at pH. And one of the problems with atopic derm is that the acidic surface becomes less acidic. And we don't know why they, that atopic derm patients can't transition the stratum corneum from a neutral pH to an acidic pH as it should happen in most individuals. One other way you can test it is sort of indirectly and show that they have a reduced irritancy threshold, which means it takes lower amounts of things like DNCB to get erythema and you measure it by erythema. So here's a cartoon of what we think is happening when we measure water loss. If we now want to try to do the stratum corneum integrity assay, that's where we take a specific tape and we tape strip it multiple times. And what we imagine we're doing is removing to different degrees layers of the stratum corneum. And if we remove more stratum corneum, because somebody's stratum corneum is not very cohesive, then we would imagine that their water loss measurement done after that will end up being higher and higher. And that's exactly what we tend to see. So if you look here, this is sequential tape strips and what happens with the water loss over those tape strips. And for most of us, that curve is a very slow slope. But in our atopic derm patients, that slope is much more acute. And so we typically present this not as the slope, but as the area under the curve. So this, in, this would be a classic atopic derm patient, and this would be a normal non-atopic individual. And again, these changes are seen in the non-lesional skin. So it really suggests that the entire epithelium 
of our patients is abnormal, not just where they have overt inflammation from skin lesions. So taking that barrier function assay and saying, much like we did with the tape stripping in the Korean infants that I showed you earlier, if we were taking this, in this case, we're taking a large Irish birth cohort, over 1,600 children that were chosen. They were all fairly low risk uh, infants, singletons, and they measured barrier function at two months of age and then brought them back into the clinic at one year to see if they had doctor diagnosed atopic dermatitis. So the hypothesis they're testing is, can we detect a barrier defect early on that helps us predict who will go on to develop atopic dermatitis at a year of age? And if you break the water loss measurements that they measured early on when there's no disease into quartiles, the top quartile group, the ones with the highest water loss, had about threefold higher likelihood of being diagnosed with atopic dermatitis at one year of age, suggesting that they do have a barrier defect that precedes the development of the disease and presumably is a risk factor for the disease. So we think this could be used just like the tape stripping where you look for the alarmant to help stratify those young, you know, young infants that might be at risk for developing early onset atopic derm. And this group, this Irish cohort group, was followed into two years um, after their water loss measurements. And they found that if they looked at the 75th percentile again, that it actually was predictive of food allergy with an even higher odds ratio of 3.5. So barrier defect was somewhat predictive of both atopic dermatitis and it's often uh, you know, co-seen uh, atopic condition food allergy. So I, I think I, I was really excited when I found this paper, which probably many of you might have known existed, and there's probably some others, but it really is, it's Michael Cork showing quite a few years ago that if you took young kids that had, were clearly, uh, that came to clinic, it was open label, and he just had his nurses educate them about how much moisturizers they should really be using as an uh, add-on therapy to manage their eczema. And so after the nurses did their education, you can see that in the blue um, graph here, their emollient use goes way up as you would hope it would with good education. And then he uses a version of uh, assessment tool that we don't use a lot of here, but it's called SASED, and showed that there was a significant drop once they started using the moisturizer. And I think it's really important for us to realize that moisturizers really are a therapy. It's just that it's hard to ask patients to sustain this on a chronic basis. And from what I've told you from the earlier um, you know, paper or earlier um, slides, this is a problem that isn't just the lesions, but it's the entire skin integument. So it really is a big ask to have our patients or their family members try to moisturize on a daily basis. But nevertheless, it's clear that it would help once you had the disease and so now we move to the data that's become very controversial, which is whether you could use moisturizers now to prevent the disease, not treat it, but prevent it. And the first couple papers that are the first two shown here got us very excited in 2014 in fairly small uh, cohorts of, in this case, I'm presenting the, the work from the UK and Oregon, where they did pick pretty high risk infants and randomized the uh, parents to the use of several different moisturizers shown on this slide to use them on a daily basis from the, uh, within weeks of birth. And the difficulty was they had over 48% of mothers who would not participate because they had to agree to be randomized and one of the randomization arms was no moisturizer. Nevertheless, I think that's what made this data probably so noteworthy because they observed one year or six months later that they uh, had a markedly reduced uh, rate of atopic dermatitis, 50% reduction, if you used a moisturizer um, immediately after birth in high risk infants, meaning infants whose both parents had atopic conditions. So since then, there've been several other much larger studies, sometimes with uh, all with different types of moisturizers, none of which who clearly told the uh, control group you cannot use moisturizers. And they have so far not really been able to reaffirm this prevention for atopic dermatitis, although there is a hint in a few of them that it might lessen the sensitization rate for food allergy 
So we're still waiting to, to understand is the problem with these larger studies that the control group was um, not ideal because they really were still using standard of care, which for most mothers are moisturizing your child, or whether the choice of the moisturizer or its frequency is critical, and or whether picking these truly high risk infants is, is the only group you would expect to see this kind of prevention effect but nevertheless hints that if you could repair the barrier with a moisturizer, you might lessen their likelihood of developing atopic derm. So microbial dysbiosis, the last part about um, the importance of the epithelium. So you all know that many of our patients are colonized with staph and some of them get infected with impetigo and folliculitis and cellulitis. Um, in general, we think that those patients who are colonized uh, pretty consistently have more severe disease. If you look at the graph over on the right, this is from a large group as part of this ADRN network where we took people who were colonized with staph and those that had no staph on their lesion or non-lesional site and looked at how high their total Ig was using that as a marker of how type two deviated they were. And again, it hinted that if you're staph colonized, you have a greater type two immune deviation systemically. We know from work that we've also done as part of ADRN that those that are colonized have greater barrier defects based on a functional assay. And that we know that microbiome shows that a commensurate with this staph colonization is a loss of microbial diversity because of the dominance of staph on the skin surface. And what I thought was really interesting is a recent paper that showed that the highest risk for a staph infection following a orthopedic procedure of an ACL repair was not insulin dependent diabetics or those on systemic steroids. It was those that had atopic dermatitis. So I thought, and this odds ratio, you can all agree, is really quite profound. What's difficult here is whenever we start talking about staph aureus, all these associations I show you here make it really hard to show causality. So do we get more staph on our skin surface because it's in the setting of more severe disease with greater inflammation that might be Th2 and greater epithelial abnormalities, including barrier defects? Or is it the other way around? Is it that staph aureus leads to these others? And I can tell you there's a tremendous amount of in vitro and murine studies that could draw the arrow in both directions. And I think the reality is in real life, it is in both directions. We would just like to know what is really more primordial. And I think at this point, we're still not sure. So why would they get this tremendous amount of staph aureus? And so just to kind of reiterate some of the ideas. We know that this is dominantly Th2 inflammation, and that Th2 inflammation will counteract the effect of Th17 response to a staph insult. And we know Th2 inflammation reduces epithelial production of antimicrobial peptides, and it causes increased expression of adhesion molecules like fibronectin and fibrinogen that make staph want to stick to the skin surface. And then lastly, we won't have time, but they have effects on the number of lipid alterations, some of these lipids of which would uh, help with eradicating staph. We also know um, that it's, it's probably due to an alteration in some of the good bacteria. And one of the categories of so-called good bacteria that might help us eradicate or minimize the amount of pathogens like staph aureus are coag negative staph, um, which we call CONS. And these are typically commensals, and we'll talk a little bit more. This is really rich in Tisa's work uh, that's really, you know, really changed how we view that a lot of the antimicrobial effects may actually be coming from the bacteria we keep on our skin surface. But pH, higher sodium uh, content, and an altered innate immune response are other explanations for why Staph aureus colonization gets established and is very hard to eradicate in these patients. So under a normal situation, if you got exposed to pathogens, you would initiate through your keratinocytes a production of a number of the um, human antimicrobial peptides. If, they, if, your, um, if your pathogen gets deep enough, it'll trigger that through mast cells. And we know one of the leakiest areas for pathogens tend to be the hair follicles, where we also have cells like sebocytes that will produce very effective antimicrobial peptides. Again, all of these will be diminished in the context of Th2 cytokines. If we have healthy amount of commensals, 
they too produce a number of antimicrobial products that could help us eradicate Staph aureus. Um, but again, when we lose the diversity, as we do in atopic dermatitis patients, we lose the relative expression of these uh, commensals that may be beneficial. So many of these uh, coag negative staff, uh, Rich Gallo and uh, Tiru have done a very nice job characterizing what they do to help us eradicate staff. And so it's really probably the combination of a poor host response and an inadequate commensal bacterial response that leads to this chronic staph aureus colonization state. And so it's really an opportunity to try to reverse this problem um, by either making it a more hospitable place for commensals by prebiotics or actually um, trying to replete commensals with a transplant approach. So this really led to this notion of we might have good and bad bacteria and this you know, holds up for skin as well as gut and other mucosal surfaces. And the, air, the good bacteria that have been best characterized are the coag negative staph, but there's some um, data to suggest there might be some other commensals that also help keep in line pathogens such as staph aureus. So if we go back to what would happen when you block type two cytokines as we can do with dupilumab, and this is going back to that original EXPLORE trial that I showed you the improvement in the epithelial keratin-16 staining. Here they looked at uh, looking at the PCR for Staph aureus. So not culture positive uh, of Staph aureus, but a more quantitative um, granular um, measurement of the amount of staph on the skin surface. And so here are the placebo-treated patients over the 16-week treatment period. And then at 16 weeks, they were taken off therapy and followed for another 16 weeks. And here are dupilumab-treated patients. And you can see that only in the dupilumab-treated patients do you see a reduction in the quantity of staph aureus as measured by qPCR by four weeks, which becomes even more significant at the later time points and is interestingly not quite back to baseline, um, even 16 weeks off. So it suggests that TH2 pathway events are part of the story that leads us to this staph colonization state. So if we again now go back to kind of early life events and ask ourselves, is there any way to try to predict those children that might get diagnosed with atopic dermatitis um, if we pick high-risk uh, children. In this case, you can see if you swab, the, the, for some reason they swab the axilla here, and if people, if these infants had high levels of the pathogen Staph aureus on their axilla shortly before AD diagnosis or at the time of AD diagnosis, you could have that helped to predict those that got diagnosed with AD versus those that weren't being diagnosed with AD in the open columns. And so it was almost five-fold increased staph aureus in this group in the axilla that then developed atopic dermatitis. If you look at the commensal that we think is beneficial, that we would want more of, they tended to have less of this than those who didn't develop AD, but it didn't reach significance. In another group, um, this is Heidi Kong's group um, with Alan Irvine, found that it's sort of the opposite idea, but still con you know, conceptually the same, that those patients who did not develop atopic dermatitis tended to have more of these good bacteria, the coag negative staph, and there's uh, several of them that they looked at in this microbiome plot that you see here, whereas the, atopic, the patients who developed atopic derm in childhood tended to have very low levels, relatively speaking, of these good bacteria. So again, it might be that bacteria early in life can also help predict your risk for developing atopic dermatitis. So we were kind of intrigued by the fact that these patients that we first followed as part of the ADRN network were the patients who had a history of eczema herpeticum, and we called that group ADEH positive. And those that didn't have a history of eczema herpeticum, we called ADH negative. And if we ask those two groups, had they ever had a history of a staph infection requiring antibiotics by mouth or IV, we found that almost 80% of those who have eczema herpeticum ended up um, giving us a history of having staph infections. So these two conditions seem to go very hand in hand. 
whereas we saw a much lower rate in our patients who did not get eczema herpeticum but still had AD and of course very rare in controls. So that made us wonder, is there something that comes from staph that leads to epithelial susceptibility to viral infections? So to address that, we used a vaccinia virus model. Again, that's what causes eczema vaccinatum. And we grew human primary keratinocytes, shown here as brown circles, um, in a test tube. We differentiated them with calcium. And then we put different strains of staph aureus in them based on how much, how much virulence factor production they have. So USA 300 is very virulent. This HG00 minimally and RN4220 is genetically non-virulent. And we asked, does that affect your ability to become infected with vaccinia virus? And I'm showing you only over here the Petri dish of media and the highly virulent staph strain but you can see many more plaques of vaccinia virus, and these plaques are larger, indicating that many more epithelial cells within that plaque are infected. So it does appear that staph could make your epithelium more susceptible to viral infections and maybe explaining that epidemiologic observation we made earlier. We then also had a patented disruptor of tight junctions that we're working on to try to develop a patch vaccine approach but we wanted to ask if we similarly now use this patented peptide to disrupt tight junctions, would that make you more susceptible to vaccinia virus? And again, here showing you the plaque, which is huge and typically cells die in the center. And here's giving you a bigger view so you can see not just this plaque, but all the other plaques. And you see that tight junction disruption would also make you susceptible to viral infections. And we had previously shown that for herpes as well. So that might be part of the reason why they get eczema herpeticum and eczema vaccinatum. So let me end by saying one of the themes that I think is emerging is how important the epithelial defects are in this disease. And although there's a dynamic interaction between the epithelium and inflammation in the surface microbes, it might be that if we could normalize the epithelium, we might really have an effect on this allergic march. And I think that's kind of highlighted by the epidemiologic data that says the best predictors of which children will go on to develop a march from atopic derm to fruit allergy to airway allergens would be family history of atopy in both parents, barrier defects as demonstrated by water loss, increased alarm in production that arguably would lead to greater Th2 inflammation, an altered ratio of bad versus good bacteria, allergen sensitization, which is really a marker of epithelial defects, and early onset AD. And I would argue that at least um, four of these really are direct epithelial abnormalities um, that really help us predict who's gonna go on. So let me conclude by saying there are a number of cardinal features we, one has to think about when they think about what drives this disease, and they're listed here in red, but I think many of them can be attributable to epithelial defects. So we talked about that many epithelial defects can be observed preceding AD onset from the production of alarmins to barrier disruption. And that if you get those defects, that that would make you more susceptible to triggering an inflammatory response and a real danger reaction and seeing any antigen as an allergen when it comes to this disrupted barrier of the epithelium. And that disrupted barrier allows the nerve endings to reach to the skin surface, making these kids and adults very susceptible to itch from virtually anything that gets ex their skin gets exposed to. We saw that the tight junctions are very disrupted and that seems to be where the antigen presenting cells are going up and sensing the superficial environment and they're more activated. And we also know that disrupting tight junctions um, either through a peptide or through staph strains leads to greater viral uh, susceptibility for the epithelium. We also know that type two inflammation um, is something that also is observed prior to AD development, at least in the form of alarmins being expressed by epithelial cells preceding the development of an infant with AD. And that that barrier disruption of any kind, whether it's bacterial scratching or through protease containing allergens, leads to the release of these cytokines we call type two alarmins because they promote further type two inflammation.
And these type two cytokines will compromise the epithelial response to pathogens and cause further barrier disruption. TH2 blockade that we have the opportunity to use through the uh, dupilumab and fairly soon through trilokinumab potentially and lebrokizumab um, will allow us to really probe how much this affects the microbiome and affects the quantity of Staph aureus or the quantity of good bacteria and whether this might help us normalize many of the epithelial features, including alarm and expression uh, bar and barrier function, which we still at this point don't know whether that would normalize barrier function. Um, and again, microbial dysbiosis we know precedes AD onset. So let me end by just saying, I, you know, a lot of these concepts are things that I've mulled over with my colleagues at UCSD for many, many years and still are ideas in evolution. So I want to thank all of them for their thoughtful comments over the years and the individual members in my lab and just highlight a few people that I showed some of their data. Takeshi, who you can tell does a lot of the imaging. Uh, Matt Brewer, who's working on the vaccine approach by disrupting tight junctions, and Mary Kate, who's trying to understand which virulence factors cause barrier disruption versus um, other uh, direct effects on epithelium. So with that, if I haven't gone too far over, I would love to take any comments or questions, which might be on the chat. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was a great talk. Um, while we're waiting for people to uh, uh, put in chat comments, I wonder if you have any further insight into the uh, one of the major complications with dupilumab, and that is the uh, the eye uh, effects and conjunctivitis. Yeah. So I couldn't look at myself while I gave the presentation, but now I can. Okay. So I. I think that, um, that one of the odd things about dupilumab, as many of you know, is that they've seen anywhere from 12 to maybe 20% of adults having some sort of ocular problems when they're treated with this TH2 blocker. It's not seen in the chronic rhinosinusitis population. It's not seen in the asthma population. So it leaves us wondering, is there some unique connection of eczema to allergic eye disease that doesn't seem to be true for the adults with asthma and the adults with chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, I, uh, and there's a little literature that does say that uh, eye disease, allergic keratoconjunctivitis and allergic conjunctivitis is a bit more common in atopic dermatitis patients than the other atopic uh, conditions. My personal bias is that I think asthma in adults is highly heterogeneous and not very TH2 polarized in the majority of patients. Um, and I think once they start treating asthma in the younger population, they will probably start seeing a little bit more of the ocular problem because it'll be much more TH2 driven uh, asthma phenotype. Why do we think it happens in either in any of these groups if we see it? Um, the hypothesis is, you know, from published literature would say that you lose goblet cells in the eye when you um, give TH2 blockade, and you also reduce their mucus production. And so since you have some of those in the eye, you would have a dry eye, and most of our patients first start out complaining about dry eyes, and then they can progress to really injected conjunctiva, edematous um, eyelids, and tremendous itch. Uh, but I think it all begins with dryness. If you have a drier eye, then your innate immune response to allergens is lost in the eye because your innate immune response to allergens in the nose and the eye is to have rhinorrhea or tearing. And you get rid of the allergens and you do better. And so um, it, 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 so one might, you know, patients like dupilumab for chronic rhinosinusitis because they don't like the rhinorrhea. They don't want to be sniffling so much, but in some ways that may not be good. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other. Larry, I see you're here. Is there, did I miss another argument here? We don't see it as much in the younger kids, the, the ocular feature from dupilumab in younger atopic derm patients, and I don't have a good explanation for that. Well, I think you got it, but of course we're recognizing now how common conjunctivitis is within the symptom complex of AD without the use of dupilumab. Mm -hmm. Even the, the at first adolescent trial in dupilumab had an incredibly high prevalence of history of conjunctivitis, a lot of it allergic 
prior to their entry in the study. Lisa, that was a fabulous talk, really great. Two comments. First of all, the answer to when papillomab supposedly uh, going to be uh, approved at younger age, the PDUFA date, as it's known in the trade, uh, the uh, prescription drug uh, FDA has to respond by date is May 26th. So, you know, so our, very you know, soon. Month. Yeah, very soon. Um, and the, the, the question I'll ask is the common question when, when, when we're getting together is, okay, so I have a pretty impressive atopic dermatitis baby at 11 months of age, and at six years, it's all better. So what, 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 what do you think it is about, about the, uh, do we have any predictive uh, factors or what do you think pathophysiologically is going on with the atopic dermatitis that does get better over time? Yeah, I mean, that's a million dollar question. Larry and I know that, you know, and Pet, the Pedra group um, at UCSD have been thinking about this for a long time. I think one of the natural experiments that happens in front of our eyes all the time is the fact that 60 to 70% of people get better or grow the disease. And wouldn't that be an absolutely phenomenal population to try to study? Is it that their epithelium finds compensatory ways to repair itself? And is that repair not just, you know, because again, I'm trying to be holistic about the epithelium. The epithelium is not just a barrier structure. I mean, the epithelium is an incredibly important inflammatory initiating cell. And so maybe it's also that it uh, has controlled some of that. Maybe the nerve endings have been addressed. Um, so that's what, those would be my hypotheses. Uh, why some people can do that and other people can't. I think may depend on the degree of smoldering inflammation because I think if you never can quiet that smoldering inflammation, then you don't have any hope about growing it. And I think you and I probably would agree on this, that in the clinic, I'm always telling my patients when I find something that works, you know, before Dupilman, it would be cyclosporin and methotrexate and phototherapy, and it still is, you know, for some of my patients. Uh, they're always puzzled why I keep them on it months after they look better. And my argument is that clinically, I'm really thrilled they're better, but I think microscopically, which is a really crude, bad, non-scientific way of saying it, that they're not better yet. And I need them, them to be quiet for quite a while in order to think those compensatory pathways will actually be allowed to be fruitful. And then I try to get off of it. Um, and I think that works. I mean, it's all anecdote. Well, we'll start to test that when we start to do very early intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be very hard because we won't be probably doing randomized trials, but we'll see. We're talking about doing those, but to see whether we can change what the expected natural history is with early immune modulation. Right, right. Really good question. Lisa, um, we ran a little over, but I want to read one last question uh, that came in our chat. I'm not sure if you see it's from Dr. Romero. And uh, she's asking a great question regarding sort of racial pre predilection to atopic dermatitis here in San Diego. Uh, for sure, we see a lot of uh, sort of an overrepresentation yeah. in Filipinos. And she wonders if there's uh, association between bacterial colonization and barrier function. In, in, in yeah, I, I can't directly, um, Dr. Romero, I can't directly answer your question about Filipino. Um, and I can't tell you for sure there's nothing in the literature about that. I can say that there have been, um, and actually um, Peter Elias did some of this early work comparing African Americans to Caucasians outside of atopic dermatitis and showing that there was greater barrier, greater water loss in African American patients as best you could control for all the other factors. And one of the arguments in the discussion was that maybe it was important for heat regulation. And so that it really was kind of, you know, it was hundreds of years of evolution living in different climates traditionally might have made that an advantage to have greater water loss. Um, and I would also want to say that one of the things I'm frustrated by by our barrier functional assays is that one, they're not super robust, meaning they're not really easy to reproduce repeatedly on the same individual, but they also are measuring the wrong direction in some ways, you know. It's interesting to know that you've got water loss and that's still valuable, but I'm really interested in how much goes in as well because almost all of our pathway cartoons are really looking how things come in and we don't really have an assay for that. I will tell you that I think the other thing that's really different with different racial ethnic groups is how you manage your skin. 
And so I know we have a lot of uh, Indian and Pakistani patients in our um, community, and they use certain uh, nut oils chronically from birth. Um, and they think that that leads to a lot lower rates of eczema. So I think there's just a lot of culturally we need to know besides whether there really might be a true racial ethnic difference that is present at birth or whether it's an acquired feature of how we manage the skin in early life and later. And then to the bacterial, I'm gonna ask you, Rich, do we know anything about racial ethnic differences on bacterial colonization? There's been a little bit of that, but not in disease states, but in it, you know, it, it's somewhat transferable over time. So it might be more like population exposures rather than um, host predilection to the colonization. What needs to be done is kind of like the old studies that were done with uh, you know industrialized versus non-industrialized uh, countries and see if you know how that car carries over within genetically identical populations. To my knowledge, that has not been done in, in the skin. It's been a little of that with fecal transplant stuff, but that's such a different regulation system that I, I don't think it's applicable to the skin microbiome. Yeah, so I know we ran over. What I'm thinking is maybe Paula can send out the answers to the polls. <laughs> I'm, I'm smiling looking at a lot of them. Um, you, you know, yeah, some of them were a little tricky, uh, but yeah, so she'll send that off. And if anyone had a question why the answer was what it was, please email me. So Paula, you, you have my okay to send out my email? Will do. All right. Uh, Dr. Beck, thank you very much. Uh, well, for sorry for some of the glitches. <laughs>